So, Paul, how goes your Linux adventure this week? I have been having a fantastic time in Linux. It is so startlingly responsive, just like really almost aggressively responsive. So you're looking for the options to slow it down? It's like, man, this is <laughs> weird when they push the button and this menu pops up right away. Is there an option to like create a quarter second delay? Well, a random delay between zero and a quarter seconds, just so it feels that. <laughs> right. Yeah. Yeah, or, or like, you know, tell it to lock the screen. It doesn't like fade to black. It's just like, boom, it's locked. Um, You know, you talk big about Linux, but like, I'll bet when you open up your little start menu or whatever you nerds call it, you don't have like random bullshit, like news and celebrity gossip from MSNBC and stupid crap in your, in your menu. Like, you're really missing <laughs> out. I Well, okay. Actually, Linux does have some of that cruft. Um, oh, so wow, that's really gross. It's got, it's got Firefox built in, and, you know, it's been great. So whenever I install a new operating system, I just use whatever the default browser is until it offends me, and then I go get Chrome. And uh, so far, Firefox hasn't right offended on. me. It's It's been fine. So um, so it's, it's doing great, but... When you bring up, you know, the splash page for Firefox or whatever, uh, it's got, you know, your most recent pages on there. But then on the very left, where the most recent pages normally go, there are two advertisements. Um, I think there's like, today it was, what, eBay and, I don't know, something else. Some sort of, you know, hosted, promoted links. Um, and, you know, that's fine. It's a free browser. They're not making money any other way. I mean, and, like, eBay's not bad. It's not like, you know doing some sort of casino site or whatever so uh sure so that's fine but uh i was also wondering like what kind of games are available in linux not like steam on linux i know you know that works um but like are there like native linux games for linux in linux like what's out there and so i just went into like the, the whatever the pop os store whatever it is their their app installer and i was like what what kind of games you got and um, top of the list, alphabetical order, Airship. And Airship, turns out, is a launcher for Valoran. And Valoran is an MMO with, like, voxel-style graphics. It, it's it got a tiny bit of voxel building, or, or maybe you can... I'm not exactly sure. I didn't get super deep into it, but um, it's kind of neat. It's kind of neat. It feels like an oh. MMO, which is... I mean, like, I'm not sure I like that, but... Uh, it and it's written in Rust. Yeah. Yes. Interesting. Uh, again, very responsive. Uh, it works well. I mean, the graphics aren't hi-fi, but it's it's stylized. Um, and it is kind of a kind of a wild ride. I think it's only about a year old. I'm not sure how old the project is. It's it's got like an import note on version 0 0.1, so it it was probably a previous something that they turned into Valoran, but um. But yeah, I had a fun time right. with it. Ran around the world, you know, explored a bit. Um, you don't really level up so much. It's uh, it's kind of a hybrid equipment level system, but your equipment isn't locked to your level, so like you can upgrade independently or whatever. Um, uh, I I see it's built like voxels, like it looks like Minecraft except a different scale. Like if Minecraft, if you were like one block high um but mm, then everything it, well, is made of blocks yeah the, the blocks feel a lot smaller but i think they might actually be the same size as minecraft blocks they might be one meter blocks but everything is not bite-sized like in minecraft like it's big there are big castles and real big mountains and uh all this kind of stuff I bet you can't dig in this game. Yeah, you can't, except for special designated digging zones. So, uh, and then the far terrain is is a height map, and so what they do is they voxelize it when you get close, which is is a nice effect, but it's kind of sure. weird that they do it that way. But that's what gives them this amazing draw distance, so you can really yeah. have like voxel mountains in a way that would you know because M Minecraft has to go down all the way, like yeah. Well, they didn't have to, but that is how they do it, yeah. And, um, but the point is that 
your computer still has that data under there, even if you can't see through the ground right now. Your computer's churning through all that underground data. Where in this game, it doesn't have to worry about it. Yeah. And that. So it's got a very. Um, it well, easier. I mean, it says on the tin, right? It's like uh, Breath of the Wild meets World of Warcraft meets Minecraft or whatever. You know, whatever the, the flavors are they've got. And uh, I've never played Breath of the Wild, but. Uh, I was running around, I ran into a wall, and I just started climbing the wall, and I'm like, oh, yes, yeah, I like nice. it. Yeah. yeah, so you just climb up whatever, and then you get to the top of the thing, and uh, you whip out your glider, just like in Breath of the Wild, and you can glide around, and it's real fun. I, I had a great time. Nice. That's really cool. So, uh, yeah, yeah, check it out. It's free. You, you can register. You have to send them your... Actually, you don't have to send them your email address. They're, they, under the registration, it's like, what username do you want? What password do you want? Hey, buddy, write your password down. We don't have your email address. <laughs> it's like, okay. All right, fine. Wow, that's cool. Yeah. Um, that's really cool. So uh, it's written in Rust. That's funny. You know, I haven't thought about Rust in months, except yesterday I came across a story on Reddit. It was actually my wife forwarded me a Reddit link. And she was like, do you know anything about this? And it was an announcement from the Rust mod team. And the mod team is like, oh, we're, you know, we, we found due to our frustrations with the core team, we, we found that they, there's no way to hold them accountable and they refuse to abide by their own rules. Therefore, the, we, the entire mod team are resigning. And we hope that, you know, the, the, community will figure out a way to handle these problems in the future and i'm like oh how interesting okay what does the mod team do what does the core team do why are they mad at each other and you read this thread and nobody's talking i still have it's like this major drama where you have no idea what's going on <laughs> you you go over to you visit your friends and you know, your friend, you see the house is in shambles and there's like a chair through one of the windows and some of the furniture is smashed. And mom's walking out the door with a suitcase and he explains that his parents are getting divorced and you're like, really, why? And he's like, nobody knows. <laughs> no idea. <laughs> it's not like, I don't want to talk about it. It's just like, Ugh. Exactly. It's not like, oh, it's really, this is a private time. I, it's kind of embarrassing. No, it's like... Nobody has any idea. <laughs> that was well, that was funny. It was just like, like what did I didn't even I couldn't even begin to figure it out because like, what are the moderators? These community moderators or are they like, what do you moderate and why would you care what the core team is doing and what standards do you need to would mods need to hold the core team to? I mean, I'm not saying it's invalid. I'm just I have no frame of reference for any of this. Yeah, yeah. If it's like an open source, you know, nobody's getting paid kind of thing, then even the slightest slight could be a, a, a packing up and leaving a fence. Well, but it sounds like it's a lot of people. If this is more than one, this is a group of people. And the way it was worded, it hints that this is some ongoing problem that has finally come to a head. Yeah, yeah. But. But there's no way to tell from the outside if this is like the guy with the admin keys decided to change all the locks and then make an announcement that everyone's leaving because they've been mistreated, or if it's actually the whole community is fed up and they've decided that right. they're all going to go do a new thing together. Like, it, where's the bottleneck there? And I'm just, I don't know. Right. I'm going to make my own casino. <laughs> with strippers and liquor. In fact, forget the casino. <laughs> yeah, well, and like, if the is this the mod like moderators or is this like mods like they're modding games or like? I have to think just, I have to think they're moderators. I will huh. link to this mis mystery drama. This, I was kind of like, uh, uh, you know, oh, I'll, I'll explain this to my wife. I'll read up on it. I'll find out about it. And then I'll explain it to my wife. And, you know, 15 minutes later, I message her back like, I have no idea what this is. <laughs> Maybe I'll turn it into an article. I can explain to everybody. 
right? I mean, turn, turn it into an article where I say, I have no idea. <laughs> oh, man. So, this week, I'm going to team up with Chris from Ramble Pack 64. Many of you might recognize him from the comments. This is something we've been trying to put together for months. Since I think before I went in the hospital or definitely before my surgery, it's just like um, he's going to live stream himself playing through Batman Arkham Origins. And I'm going to sit mm. in and we're going to talk about the game and hopefully have a good time. Um, we've been trying to put this together forever and it's just been getting delayed and delayed for like, I don't know, four or five months. It's ridiculous. So... That is happening on Tuesday. There will be a link in the show notes to um, to where the stream is going to happen, to where you watch it, um, and along with the time and everything. So I hope that some of you will join us. Yeah, sounds fun. Backseat driving Batman Arkham Origins is going to be real hilarious. Right. Now, this is not my favorite of the Batman games. In fact, it's the only one I'm not really a fan of. But it's a really interesting game, and um, there's a lot to be said about it. I wrote a retrospective on it. I mean, like a lightweight, you know, back when I was doing really short retrospectives, before I started doing these novellas. Yeah. So there's much left to say about this game. Um, yeah, so this coming Tuesday, we're going to start that. I hope that cool. you folks will join us. And is this the same Chris that writes in all the time? Yes. No, uh, yeah. I don't believe... <laughs> I don't believe that's the Chris that writes into the diecast. Uh, I don't think so. Yeah, I'd, okay. I'd recognize his name in the... Thing. Different Chris. So this is a different Chris. All right. Well, what else do you have going on this week, Paul? Well, I did, uh, I did play some actual steam games some real games and uh i was able to so i got a notification on my phone because i got steam on my phone it's like hey one of the games you want to buy is on sale i'm like oh neat it's potion craft oh, yeah the autumn sale yeah hmm yeah the black friday thing or whatever yeah so i uh, i looked it up and like potion craft i've been looking at for a while it, it looks like a neat game um and it's not expensive i think it's like 15 bucks and it was you know, 30% off or whatever. So like almost 10 bucks, hardly, hardly worth thinking about. Just buy a copy and check it out. So, um, so I picked it up and, uh, oh, well, so that, that was an adventure in itself, right? Cause the steam store page doesn't work on Linux. So I tried it anyway. And right. magic of magic. If you click on the link in your email or whatever, then it takes you to the steam store page in the steam browser and that one works for some reason so maybe it's just like the front page doesn't work um but it, it I, I was able to get to my my store page for the thing and actually complete the transaction so it works for the part that matters giving them your money uh you know figures right, <laughs> right. they've got their priorities and uh, installed just fine and you know runs just fine it's, it's in unity so i think it's native or mostly native to to linux or cross compatible or whatever and uh booted it up and first impressions well i mean i i beat the game so like i've been all the way through it but the first impression was it's gorgeous like it's it's got a, a, a really really deeply cohesive visual design like the whole thing is this uh medieval kind of quasi neo-medieval art style hand-drawn kind of um charcoal sketching kind of thing and um really really solid visually we're talking about potion craft here yeah what is the like what do you do in the game aside from craft potions like no that's it what's the you just make potions it's just it's just potion craft is it like a cooking game where you get orders that you have to fill oh uh, yeah kind of so so the core of the game is this map and it it um the game mechanic is that you have all these ingredients and the ingredients are these little trails, like they're they're a pattern, but you can't rotate them or flip them or anything. They're just what they are. So they go in some direction and, and they're not straight lines. They're all squiggly, wiggly, weird shapes. 
And so it's kind of a Tetris-y game where you got to take these weird shapes and, and kind of piece them together to get your little potion to go where you want it to go so that you can get the effects that you want. And so that's like the first part of the game is just exploring the map using these ingredients. And you have to buy the ingredients and some of them grow in your gardens. So you can pick them and you can trade with traders. And uh, you, so you get these ingredients, you accumulate them and then you drop them into the, the, the pot and stir them around. And as you stir them, they move and then you can, there's some other mechanics of, of moving things. It's it's very simple and very clever. And I was really impressed with how how tight the game design is as well. Um, it's It's very difficult traversal in the sense that it's hard to get it's not trivial to just go from one place to another, but it's also very wieldy. Um, so like Super Meat Boy is kind of the opposite, right? Where where it's unwieldy and it's really difficult to get it to do what you want it to do. It's very fiddly and and twitchy. Right. Um, Potion Craft is kind of the opposite. It's, it's not twitchy at all. You can go as slow or as quick as you want, um, but it's still difficult because you've got these limited resources, you've got limited space, there are hazards on the map that you have to avoid. Uh, you're trying to get to really specific locations, but you're trying to do it in a way that is as inexpensive as possible. So it's this, this is a whole puzzle. Um, so the first part of the game is it's just exploring the map and finding all the different spell effects and, uh, you know, and, and writing down all your recipes. And then when you have a recipe written down in your book, you can just say, like, make it again, and you don't have to do the whole thing again. You can just pop and it's done. So that's really cool too. And then you can go back and revisit them when you get new different ingredients or, you know, figure out a, a different technique that might be better. Um, so that's the first half is just like exploring the game. And then there's this alchemy engine in the basement. And that's kind of the second half of the game is the alchemy engine requires, unlike your customers who just want like one spell effect, they want a healing potion or a lightning potion or whatever. Um, the alchemy engine in the basement has all these, you put all these different crazy potions in. It's got like one lightning and two health and a, a libido effect or whatever and it's like well oh what would you use that for no you just put it in the <laughs> alchemy engine right and you put all these weird things in the alchemy engine you pull the crank and out comes this weird stone and, and then you use that to make another weird stone and then use that to make a, a salt that allows you to do some special stuff so um that the game's still early access so it's still being developed and that part of it is not very well developed yet um so i'm, I'm looking forward to seeing what they do with it but uh, there's a whole, that whole second half of the game that's, uh, that kind of opens up. And so then serving your customers is just kind of a, a side thing you do while you're exploring this, you know, this crazy alchemy thing and trying to do all these crazy paths zigzagging across the whole map and that kind of stuff. So it was really fun. I, I think I've got about 35 hours into it and I, I've completely wow. done a hundred percent run through already. So that's not too bad. Uh, you know, 30 hours for a, a full run. But um, yeah, and I could have done much better if I had known what I was doing or, or paid attention to what I was doing. So I've made a, a potion craft spreadsheet. I don't know if anyone else has one. I'm sure someone must have, but um, <laughs> you know, there's a, a link. good game when Paul makes a spreadsheet of it. Yeah, right. The Islanders, the Islanders spreadsheet. Now there's a potion craft spreadsheet. Um, I got some games too at the sale. Ooh. I got um, Manifold Garden, finally. Oh, yes. I, I've only played like 20 minutes of it. I um, I really loved it. It was great 20 minutes, but I got outside of that first little area, right? Mm. And you can just fling yourself into the abyss. And then you land right where you were again, because the, the world is not circular, but it's um, looping. Right? Mm. <laughs> so if you, you fall for, you, you fall 100 meters, you land on the platform you jumped off of. And right. um, I, I just got caught up doing that and changing direction and then falling up and falling sideways and sort of lost the plot of where I was supposed to be going. <laughs> <laughs> like, I don't remember the point of the puzzle or what my goal was. And I couldn't remember, like, which one of these features am I supposed to be going towards? And where's my goal in this vast, weird universe? And I abstract yeah yeah that's as far as i go with that and i got <laughs> okay yeah so i mean it's really great but i did sort of like sabotage my own playthrough by jumping off the path and running off into the wilderness sort of now i've got to find my way back to the mm, the planned content 
the structured well, content. The, yeah, the nice thing about yeah, the nice thing about that is because it's wrapping, it looks huge, but it's actually not that big, and so you can't really right. get lost. Like you can't get that far away from where you're supposed to be. Right, right. Um, I got Cloud Punk just because it's cyberpunk, and there's Ooh, like yeah. There's just supposed to be some game about going around a cyberpunk city, but I didn't care about the game. I just wanted to drive around a cyberpunk city, and maybe I'll play the game, but maybe I'll just drive around the city. I don't know. We'll see. And I got Professor Fizzwizzle. <laughs> hmm. it, it was only $2. It was a... Uh, Professor Fizzwizzle was one of the first indie games I ever played way back when my kids were little. I remember, the, you know, my kids are all adults now, but I remember them playing, sitting on my lap and playing Professor Fizzwizzle. And so I, like, I don't need this game, but I just, <laughs> nostalgia compelled me to put it in my cart. Oh, fun. You know, I mean, this was like pre-indie revolution, really, I think. Like back yeah. when indie games were like hard to make and they were rare. Now, of course, most games are indie games. <laughs> yeah. I was fascinated by uh, by Cloudpunk. It, it seemed... Cloudpunk? Yeah. Yeah. It seemed really neat, and I, I watched a couple of trailers and stuff, but it, it seemed like the game that they were pitching wasn't a game that I was interested in playing. So I just I watched a little bit, and then I was like, okay, I get it. But uh, yeah, if you just want to drive around the, the city, maybe that would do it. There are other games I uh, I wanted, but um, you know we're gonna wait a little while to get those. Mm. But there's a, th this Steam sale is like my entire wish list is on sale. I'd buy it all oh, if man. I had the money. Yeah, so it's just like a really good Steam sale. So I'm like, all right, <laughs> how how much can I justify spending on games for myself just before Christmas? Because just before Christmas. It's like I'm supposed to be buying presents for other people, not, you know, stocking up to get me through the lean months of summer. <laughs> All right. Um, here's another thing I've been doing. I've been getting abandoned by various series. I mm. I have this terrible I have this terrible habit of not check I I hate like episodic shows now. I want to binge through an entire show. Right. I do not want to sit there every week and watch, you know, get another spoonful of story. It reminds me of being a kid and, you know, uh, my mom would read me, you know, two more pages of Lord of the Rings. And I'm like, oh boy, by the time I'm 35, I'll know how this story ends. <laughs> <laughs> um, so, so I watched the Dune movie and that, and then I got to the end and it was, you know, only part one. And I was like, oh, now I've got to wait like two years to find out how it turns out. Fine. And then Hawkeye. The Hawkeye movie is out. Oh, wait, that's not a movie. It's a TV show and there's only two episodes. I got to the end of the second episode and found out that's all there is. Ah, gotcha again. And then Amazon has Wheel of Time. And I watched that and then I got to the end of the third episode and realized that's all there is right now. And I don't know when more it's coming. So I'm like really irritated that I keep falling for this and watching the first <laughs> part of things. Like I need to remember, don't start watching something until it's done. Oh, now I'm really frustrated. Got it's like in my, my dad used to have like around his apartment he always had like 20 books all just open face, you know, face down. You know, he didn't use bookmarks. He would just place the book open on the floor or whatever, or on a coffee table. And he was always in the right. middle of all of these books. And I'm like, how can you stand that? It would make me crazy. Wow. Um, but here's the thing. I don't know anything about Wheel of Time. In fact, I didn't hear of Wheel of Time until the 90s. I knew nothing about it except that I became aware that it was a big deal and some people were excited about it. I didn't know, like, if it was sci-fi or fantasy. I know there was, like, supposed in the 90s people were talking about a mod or a game or a total conversion or something that had to do with Wheel of Time. And as far as I can tell, it never materialized. Like, I was like, oh, maybe when that comes out, I'll find out what this is. <laughs> and then it never did. Um, but now they're doing this Wheel of Time um, series on Amazon. 
and I'm curious, like, what's the consensus? I know it was really popular 20 years ago, but like, does it hold up? Do people still regard Wheel of Time today? And how does this show hold up for those that have watched it? Have, are, are you into Wheel well, of Time? I was first introduced to Wheel of Time in college in like 2004 or something. Um, I guess when Crosswords of Twilight came out, everyone was like, oh, Wheel of Time, next book in Wheel of Time came out. It's amazing. And um, so I, I had never read them. And so I started at the beginning with Eye of the World. And uh, I got through, I think... I think uh, book two and started reading book three and uh, it lost me. I was like, okay, I see, I see what you're doing and uh, I'm not interested in your, your author tract. So uh, I never really got into it too deep. <laughs> okay. Um, but at the same time, there was a group of uh, guys doing role-playing games and they're like, Hey, there's a wheel of time role-playing game setting. And so uh, I played a, a campaign of wheel of time role-playing as well. So I mean, I'm familiar with the setting in that sense that I know the upside down from right side up, at least <laughs> ostensibly, uh, you know, 15 years ago. Did you get to break the wheel? Uh, no, the, the wheel breaks you in the wheel of time. Oh, they talk about breaking the wheel. And I'm like, oh boy, uh, I bet the wheel is the final boss. This <laughs> is a wheel full of eyes inside and out. And you're in revelation. <laughs> Just gotta break it. <laughs> Use leap enough times and X attack. Um, so I'm very curious from for fans that have watched the show. What do you think of it? Um, I don't know what to think. I don't know what to make of it. Like I'll see a couple scenes and I'm like, ugh, just sort of this groaning that that when it feels like teen drama and a couple of teenagers are into each other and I'm like, I just, I just don't care what these idiots do. I do not care if these two <laughs> idiots bone or not. There, I have no stakes in this. <laughs> right? There's, I realize it's a big deal to them, but, you know. Wheel of Time, I'm taking you off the case. I'm too old for this shit. <laughs> Turn just, in your badge. I, you're a loose cannon. You're a loose wheel. Uh, yeah, I just <laughs> don't care about the um, about the... The young adult romance stuff. I mean, not that that's invalid. I'm not saying, hey, that, that's stupid. You shouldn't tell stuff. But that's just not my... That's not my genre. And I'm just... Not your, your wheelhouse? Right? <laughs> um, but, like, there was an episode where they went to this dead city. And I was, like, really into the idea of this dead city. And then, spoiler, they're, barely, they're there for, like, one scene. And then they leave. And I'm like... But this city was the cool idea so far. Like, the whole thing is, okay, you're fighting an army of orcs. I'm sorry, Trollocs. Trollops. Mm -hmm. They're fighting an army of Trollops. <laughs> and I'm like, okay, I've kind of seen this before. And, okay, you're, you're, you, get to the, you get to the ferry. I've kind of seen that before. And I just feel... Now, this doesn't mean that Wheel of Time is like unoriginal it probably means that a lot of other stuff has stolen from wheel of time and so i've already heard this story through all of the works that have stolen from it over the years um, yeah well i mean it is high fantasy it does borrow heavily from right. tolkien and all that right. which i mean to be fair tolkien borrowed from all the ancient mythology so it's, there isn't that much new material you can actually come up with but yeah it is right it is a little but um I, it, it lost me when it got to like the the uh, what so the, like all the spell casters are women because men go insane if they do magic or something except for the main character because he's special and a chosen one and he can he's amazingly powerful and stuff and so I was like okay he's a little bit M Marty Stu territory there um, but then there's like this in the second or maybe the third book there's like all these slave spell casters and there's like this whole race of like slavers that like enslave women and then like force them to do the kind of things that people who enslave women force them to do. And it was like, eh, I don't, I don't know. I don't, I'm not really into that either. Like, right. Eh. Right. I, but I did like every once in a while, the story had an idea that I would really dig. Oh, this is a fun. Yeah. Idea. Yeah. Or, and, and like I said, I was really into the city 
That's the that, that's the most recent thing I saw that I thought was really cool was the city. Um, mm. And then th there were a couple. I, other I remember ideas. that part in the book, and it's it's the same way in the book where they're like they show up at this dead city. And it's like, oh, what's the history of this? And there's all these you know ancient spells that were cast here, and it's all like space and time has warped itself or whatever. And it's like, whoa, cool. When are we going to learn about this? But then like everything you learn about is like all the brooding and the drama and like the you know the the shadowed eyes. And it's like, oh, I don't, I'm not really that interested in your your brooding dramatic characters. Like, tell me about your world that you're talking about. Right. And, uh, but so it's m m very much a right down the middle fantasy epic, which I'm not super into, but I do like, but I'm, I'm willing to stick with it for these cool ideas it pulls out once in a while. So that's where I'm at. But like, who knows? Uh, I need to figure out like, when will the last one of these episodes come out and then come back to it then <laughs> probably sometime this spring for this season anyway. Right. I don't mind a season ending and like waiting a year for the next season. I just hate the weekly, you know, slow drip. Mm. And I hate what it does to the structure of shows. How you're, it's like you're sitting there binging your way through it and it's like last week on the show you just watched five minutes ago, <laughs> five seconds ago. <laughs> so you skip the intro credits. Then you skip the recap, then you get into the show, then they stop early so they can show you a preview of next week, Then you s and you skip that because you don't want any spoilers, then you skip the closing credits, and it's like, you, you've you got like an hour long show, but only 40 minutes of it is useful. <laughs> this is as bad as when it was commercial television. You've still got these huge blocks of useless crap for me to to work around mm. it's it's like they don't realize that binging is a thing like why would anybody need a recap go watch the previous one if <laughs> how short is your memory uh, i suppose this is some people watch 20 different shows and so they need a recap because they because it all blurs together in their mind but if you're like me and you just sure. binge through one show it feels really weird or they're they're doing netflix and chill and not really paying attention to the show Right. That would be a funny idea is to do recaps that are completely misleading and don't and show things that didn't happen in the previous episode. And you're like, wait, what? <laughs> <laughs> show them fighting a dragon. And you're like, wait, I don't remember a dragon. <laughs> One of them right. gets in a mecha suit and you're like, I, I'm sure I'd remember that. And they're all... They're all like illusions cast by the thing at the beginning of the episode or whatever. Right. No oh, fun. Or even better to do next week previews that are totally misleading. Just outright, just pure bald faced lies. You know, show characters dying that aren't going to die. Show, show, this is just possible like a funeral romances. every time. Right. Like romance pairings that make no sense. <laughs> Is just like fan fiction previews. Right. Like Boromir and Gandalf making goo goo eyes at each other, and you're like, oh, whoa, this, this show's really going off the rails. And then, and then none of that's in the next episode. It's just like straight laced all the way through the next episode. Right, right. Negative preview review continuity. Yeah. I'm sure someone must right. have done that at some point. I'm sure people will let us know in the comments. All right. What do you say we do some mailbags? Yeah. Hello, Seamus and Paul. There was an interesting thread on Twitter about how games are a very young medium and we're still exploring all the possibilities to represent the real world or create new ones. Um, blah, blah, blah. Most games deal with violence. And um, we're on the 20th iteration of 3D shooters, the third iteration of photo games, and the zeroth iteration of anything else possible. What are your thoughts on that? Do you have some ideas of non-violent video games could look like? Paul, do you filter games you let your kids play based on how immediate violent the response they get from the game? Best regards, Ilya. So since he, this person, um, uh, asked you a question directly, I'll let you answer that first. Do you filter games for your kids? Uh, we do a little bit. Um, we don't really play my wife and I don't really play like the kind of games that we would be uncomfortable letting our kids play in the first place. So we don't like 
play games after they go to bed or whatever. It's just like, you know, where, whatever we're playing is, is fine. Um, RimWorld is, it can be pretty gruesome, but it's all kind of abstract art. I mean, it's not super abstract, but it's not graphically violent. It's just, you know, uh, amputations and things. It can be pretty, um, pretty bad, but it's not in your face. So that's not too much of a problem. I, I'm trying to think. Oh, yeah. Okay. So, um, Back when I was playing Satisfactory, it was first on Epic, you could log into your Epic account on multiple computers and play multiplayer with yourself without buying another copy. And so I was playing multiplayer with my kids uh, in Satisfactory because, you know, we could. It was fun. And um, so I walk away from the um, the game. I'm going to go do something else, right? And Satisfactory, it doesn't matter, you know, like, if you walk away. It's not like monsters are roaming around the world that are going to come kill you or whatever. Like, if you're in your base, you're fine. Right. Um, so I come back, and I'm looking at my my son's screen, and there's, like, this woman on the floor, and he's just, like, tasing her over and over and over again. <laughs> I'm like, is that my character? He's like, yeah, it's really funny. And so, like, I watch, and then, like, after, like, you know, five seconds or whatever, you respawn and stand up again. And then you start tasing her again. And then you like fall over and die and then respawn. And I was like, I don't really know if I want you to like be practicing violence against women in this way. And so, uh, and, and shortly after that, they fixed the bug where you could multiplayer with yourself. So it wasn't an issue, but, um, we did have to kind of like push that to the side a bit. <laughs> <laughs> you gotta teach your son, look in the real world, women hit back. Stick and move. That's right. <laughs> Be careful. Uh, so, uh, so yeah, we, we don't really... I guess the, the only other one I can think of is um, uh, Deep Rock Galactic, which has mature language, like all the combat barks and stuff. Uh, a lot of them are, are swears and things, and I don't mind it personally too much myself, but I don't really want to expose my kids to that, so I, I have stopped playing Deep Rock Galactic on that, uh, on that count. So... Yeah, we do a little bit, but we don't normally play the kind of games that we would need to filter them. So, yeah. For me, the sort of... I, I haven't felt the need to visit this topic in ages because I kind of feel like Chris Franklin of Errant Signal sort of just did the final mic drop on this topic. Um, mm. he, he I makes... remember listening to his, his, um, his video essay and it was... It was well thought out. I I disagree on some fundamental points, but uh, on the whole, yeah, he, had, he has a very good uh, overview of the the issue. His his argument is that games are really good at spatial simulations. You know that is something that computers are uniquely good at. That is hard to do without a computer. You don't do a spatial mm. simulation. You just do a spatial activity <laughs> we just you know we just go out in the yard and kick the ball around um, yeah but if you know we wanted that ball to explode like like you've said in the past that would be too expensive to do in real life um because uh explosives and limbs are expensive yeah human life um, right so but you can do that in a video game and it's like, haha, you know, I blew you up. I tased you to death over and over again, but it's no problem to walk back out. Um, just that games are sort of uniquely suited to physical simulations in the real world. And when people are like, why don't we have nonviolent games? Often the nonviolent stuff they're talking about is all stuff that computers would be terrible at. How come computers, like, you can sh murder them, but you can't have a conversation with them? And it's like, well, that's that's not because game de designers are lazy. <laughs> it's because computers cannot do the latter. Right. Um, if and it's if you could have a conversation time. with a computer, then, like, a real conversation, then that would be... It on well on its way to like convincing low cost AI and like that's a that's a completely different thing like it's not a game at that point right, that would change the world in multiple ways like in ways that we don't fully understand yet so 
Um, careful what you wish for you get there. You'll probably get it sooner or later, but it's not because game designers are lazy or stupid. I mean, the for one thing, the, the most popular games are Call of Duty, but also FIFA. And one of them is violent, and one of them is... I mean, FIFA is violent, but let's, you know, that's not what people mean when they complain about violence in video games. They're not talking about guys mm -hmm. kicking each other. Right. Um, and so, you know, when you've got racing games and and you've got other sports and you've got cooking games and The Sims and Sim City and uh, there's actually an awful lot of nonviolent games these days. Um, so, or at least, and, and if you count like games that aren't centered on violence, although they do contain them, like uh, Stardew Valley, for example, like it's got some sword stuff in there, but it's not about sword fighting. Right. And I mean, Sim City like has, okay, you can destroy your city with a meteor. Yeah. And there are police. Right. <laughs> right. But you can also just destroy your city by cutting off the water supply. I mean, it's, <laughs> it's like, I don't know. It, it's, um, I don't really think that games are, given how well they simulate physical violence and how bad they are at, like, more creative type activities, I think games do a pretty darn good job of offering a really wide range of possible activities. Hmm. Yeah, um, I agree that that they're not. Um, it's not that the industry is unhealthily focused on violence. It's that the medium itself is serving a, a need in the community. Like it, like people want to be able to learn about and explore things that they can't normally access. They want to drive giant trucks around, and you know, trucking Euro Truck Simulator. That's a popular game, and spin it's not tires. because. Yeah, and spin tires and all the driving games, right? Like, there are a lot of people who want to do that. And it's not because, like, there's this weird underground thrust to have driving games in the gaming community. It's because that's the thing that's hard to do in real life and, and really dangerous if you do it wrong. And so, like, right. yeah, people want to be able to do that and, and play with it and learn from it without having the, the hazard of killing people if they make a mistake. All right. Go ahead and take this next one. Dear Diecast. Have you heard the recent interview with, oh no, with Chet Falazek? Falazek. No, sorry, Falazek. Chet Falazek? Falazek. I thought it might be relevant to you, i.e. Seamus' interests. My favorite part is the secret origin of Old Man Murray as a gray market games reseller. John. Thank you, John. So, thank you so much for this link. I've been working, okay, for, for heads up, this is a really good podcast. It is fantastic. It is filled with great stories, but it is two hours and 50 minutes long. Ooh. It is, I've been working on it for two days trying to listen to the whole thing. And I've still got like, you know, I've still got like half an hour left. My favorite story from this podcast, uh, Chet Falazek is, um, I think the creative lead from um, Left for Dead. Oh. Yeah, he, okay, just to say who this guy is, he and Eric Wolpaw ran the site Old Man Murray, which was hugely influential to me. It was a writing about video games site. It was supposedly a video game review site, but it was, um, it was comedic in nature. Like, and it was um, also a bit more than that, right? Like it had some sprawling tendrils uh, into other areas. Right, right, right. Um, well, he talks about that, like how they started out just reviewing games and then they realized like, oh, you know, this, this, as their site became so big, they no longer felt like they were just a couple of guys just mocking stuff for fun. They kind of felt like now they're punching down, like, okay, this game is flawed, but it's mm. a tiny team. I mean, back then all games were kind of indie games by today's standards and they didn't want to just crap all right. over this earnest effort and they felt like they were punching down. And, they, and so they started looking for other ways to do comedy that wasn't just mocking somebody's honest work. Hmm. But Old Man Murray was hugely influential on me and made me want to write about games and made me want to write funny stuff. Like, DM of the Rings might not have happened if not for Old Man Murray. My blog might not have happened. 
my escapist job might not have happened. And then they, right around the launch of Half-Life 2, they both went to work at Valve. Chet went to work on Left 4 Dead, and Eric went to work on Portal. And Eric is basically responsible for the comedy of Portal. And you can even go back to Old Man Murray and find Eric writing anything about, you know, the AI apocalypse or crazy robots or robot overlords overthrowing us. And you'll oh, see sure. all, all the roots of GLaDOS. I mean, that's like, that was just a, well, he liked to, that was a a genre of jokes he told well and really enjoyed. Mm, he'd been practicing for years. Right. He'd been preparing his whole life to write about an asshole computer. <laughs> um, but the a great story from Left 4 Dead, they were showing off the game to various other developers, right? And Peter Molyneux comes in with part of his team. Maybe they were at some kind of convention. Mm-hmm. I can see it. Um, they start playing, and like 15 seconds into the map, Peter Molyneux gets pounced by a hunter. His team makes absolutely no effort to save him and just keeps going without him as he just died. And then he got up <laughs> from the computer and left without a word. Oh, no. <laughs> <laughs> and it just sort of like, that's exactly what I would expect to happen with Peter Molyneux's team. You oh, always no. get the, you always get the sense that he is the weakest link in his team, and that um, I mean, based on the anecdotes I hear coming out of Lionhead, it was always like he was the weakest link on the team, and that he kind of drove his people crazy. Oh man, the weakest the link with the biggest mouth. Exactly. That he just caused no end of trouble to his employee and that they would immediately leave him without a word and without the slightest tingle of guilt is just this perfect. <laughs> that's exactly what, oh, what you would no. expect to have happened based on all the rumors. And I'll bet you the rest of them worked together flawlessly and got through it with, <laughs> with zero casualties. <laughs> oh, man. Oh, it's so sad. Let's not talk about Peter Molyneux anymore. Fair enough. Anyway, this podcast is amazing. I'm still working on it. It's filled with awesome stories like that. It's basically the history of Chet from his early days, how he got into computer science, how he sort of like, I mean, even about his childhood, his dad played cards for a living, if you can believe that. Hmm. Um was a bit of a hustler, but he also had a real job. But, you know, he brought in quite a bit of their money f with hustling. And th that made for some interesting stories. And then Chet um, and met Eric and they did a bunch of, they had a consulting company together. And that's where the name Murray came from. They came up with this idea. They wanted to make a consulting company and they called it Murray and Sons because everything else was like, you know, APC systems or, you know, XYZ consulting or, or whatever. Mm. And it was always very sleek and very dot com y by today's standards. And they wanted it to make it feel like this, their company had been around. So they just called it Murray and Sons. Huh. And they, they said this was really useful because they were like, supposedly that people just assumed they were brothers or cousins or like somehow related and that there was somebody else. They, they would like make it sound like they weren't running the business. Like, like they weren't, this, they didn't want to haggle with people. So they would just blame the prices on the owner. <laughs> Right, right. Uh, I'd have to talk to old man Murray about that. I can't, exactly. can't promise anything. Right, exactly. So it let them create a fictional bad cop and let them play good cop, which is the socially <laughs> the easiest way of doing it. Um, sure. And that led to old man Murray, the site. And they were a gray market. The gray market game seller was games that were supposed to be exported right like oh here's a game made in america but it's going to europe right back in the day when you had like a box with a cd 
you're going to ship right. physically to Europe. Right. But there's no law that says it has to. And when you do that, you have to like mark it way down because otherwise it would be too expensive. You know, this people in this small European country, especially if it's going to be Eastern Europe, they're not going to have they're not going to have America bucks to buy this game. The price needs mm -hmm. to come way down and they need to pay for all the shipping and the publishers willing sure. to, you know, European VAT the... and all that. Exactly. And s the publisher wants those people's money too. So they, they lower their take on it, but then you can buy that and then just keep it in the States. There's some, there was some legal loophole that uh, as long as you're not buying it to keep it, um, you're allowed to buy it. And then, you know, ostensibly you're supposed to export it, but there's no law making you export it. So you just turn around, mark it up to normal American prices and then sell it here. Hmm. And, and, uh, that's how they, that's how they started getting review copies of the games or whatever. That's how they, they, the old man Murray got started. I've probably butchered it, but that's the general gist of it. Anyway, it's almost three hours of Chet talking about working at Valve and working on these games. And I have to say again, every time he talks about Gabe Newell, I feel, uh, I feel like, wow, that's exactly what I would have done. Even when, even when Gabe Newell makes a dumb mistake that like loses a bunch of money, I'm like, that's exactly the move I would have made. <laughs> <laughs> you know, it just feels like the right move. Mm. And um, so I don't know if Gabe and I are cut from the, from the same cloth or whatever, but um, similar attitudes towards management. Um, another story, I'll tell one more. They were talking about they took over Counter-Strike from whoever was in charge of it. And the community was really nervous. Hey, we've got a giant company yeah, in charge of Counter-Strike now. And they had to, and there was no official spokesperson, you know, it wasn't like there was Bob Counter-Strike that they could fly out for, for a week and talk to him. It's please, just please, Mr. Strike. <laughs> so the, they just had to like figure out where does this community live? Who are the pillars? And we have to get to know, we just have to get to know these people, communicate with them, build bridges with them. And figure out what they need from this game. What kind of hats do they want? <laughs> right. Chet even jokes at one point where, um, when it comes to Team Fortress, or, or no, no, it was Weapon Skins. He was like, Weapon Skins are probably a waste of time. That's not going anywhere. And he laughs at himself now because that was a billion dollar idea. Like everybody, mm. like, you know, other companies have taken that idea and just made that their central monetization scheme um anyway they build relationship with the community and then sort of work with the community to figure out what they need they're not going out like okay now who do we want to pivot to <laughs> right that's what ea would do all right we just bought this popular thing now what larger audience can we pivot to and serve and to hell with this original community but no they mm. And it would never occur to anybody at, at EA like, well, just, you know, they would be, they would be like, we should do market research. We should do a focus group. And Valve's attitude was just, well, you know, hang out on the forums and fucking talk to them. <laughs> this isn't hard. They're right. people. Like, just have a conversation with them. Sign up for an account if you don't have one already. Right. And it was... It was trivially easy to do and yet impossible for modern developers to do. There's just no way they would do that. Um, yeah. And I correct me if I'm wrong, but I think ca the Counter-Strike community is largely happy with Valve. Yeah, it seemed like it seemed like they were uh, they were not displeased. I I, I wasn't right. ever a deep part of the community myself, but. Uh, from what little wafted over into my area of the internet, I, I was, I, I never heard anything bad about him. Anyway, I'm sorry for cherry picking all the best parts of this podcast. There's lots more. I recommend this to anybody who's into Valve and Valve games. 
This is one of the best podcasts I've ever heard. It was just absolutely delightful, filled with filled with wonderful nuggets of just great stories and great insights into the industry. So thank you for the link. All right, I get the sense maybe we're running long, but let's uh let's let's do one more. Dear Diecast, I recently watched Design Doc's latest video on good design, bad design to do with UIs in video games. I thought it was very interesting and wondered if you had your own best and worst picks for video game UIs. Do you have a preference? Diegetic versus non-diegetic? Any other thoughts on the topic if you feel so inclined? Kind regards, Andrew. So diegetic AI, for those who don't immediately grasp that, is like, or not AI, UI. Diegetic UI would be when it's um, integrated into the world itself. Like, your, the user interface is something that the characters in the world can see. Um, the the mm. example in this video is in Astroneer, when, like, your oxygen, dis, your oxygen, there is no HUD. There, there are no numbers or anything displayed on the screen. You, to know how much oxygen you've got, you look at your backpack, which is on your back, and to... And it's a third-person game, so that works. Um, right. and I was going to say, no, the character in-game will not know when they're running out of oxygen. <laughs> right. <laughs> um, so, and if you want to know how much stuff is in a certain container, you look, it's got a little slot on the side where you can just look and see. So all of the information you want is in the world. And it works pretty mm. good, but you obviously can't do that in all games. Or um, maybe you wouldn't want to in all games. Right. It would be a little weird. But, you know, some sometimes it's really good like if they can if you can ha if you have a setting that allows you to have your ammo counter on your gun and so you don't need to have this floating number that's just not part of the world floating in the corner of the screen so that you can just look at your gun to know how many bullets you've got left. That's cool. Yeah. Or if you want to make uh, the game miserable for people like in receiver for example right <laughs> right where it's very realistic in that you look at a gun and you don't know how many bullets are in it unless you eject the mag and <laughs> then and then oops now you still don't know because you you didn't grab the mag you just ejected it and now it's on the ground and you're trying to pick <laughs> it up and somebody's shooting at you and now you're dead again but you you're pretty sure you had two bullets left. <laughs> right. You forget that there's one still in the chamber. Right. D does receiver let you shoot yourself to death? Yes. Abs That's yeah. awesome. It's, it's, not, it's not hard to do. It's actually something that, <laughs> that you do all the time. <laughs> Starting off. <laughs> Especially if you're... If you're trying to holster your gun so that you can do something with both your hands, like climb a ladder or whatever, and you forget to put the safety on, you will shoot yourself in the foot. And that may very well kill you. All right, so a real quick sort of lightning round of good and bad um, UIs. Uh, space Chem. I love the non-diegetic Space Chem UI because it maps directly onto the keyboard. And so I don't have to look down at the keyboard all the time. I can see on the screen where my hands need to go to do the commands that I want. It's so good. I don't want to praise Minecraft as a whole, but I've always really loved the crafting by just putting things in a grid. I thought that was inspired. Um, it has the problem of how do you know what you can make? And I don't well, think... Well, nowadays it's not a problem because there's the recipe book, but... Right. But at, at... In the beginning, when there was no recipe book and you just had to look it up on the wiki, that was not great. But, um, yeah. But I think the overall idea of the crafting grid was brilliant. I think mm, Thief's... Bad UI. Yeah. Oh, one more. I think Thief's visibility gem was brilliant. It's like, it's really hard to interpret, like, how visible does this game think I am? Especially when you're talking late 90s when shadows had these huge jaggies on them. So mm. like you move two pixels over and suddenly you're in bright light because you're infinitely small point. It, I can see how somebody <laughs> yeah. would be like, oh, it's not realistic for us to just tell them. They're supposed to figure that out. But it's like, this system's arbitrary enough and capricious enough 
yeah, the gem was an excellent way to just help the player understand something that would have been obvious to the player character. Mm -hmm. So what do you got for bad UI? Uh, it's civilization games. All those civilization games with their unsortable spreadsheets and their list of cities that you can't find the one you want. And it's just yeah. nightmarish. Um, I'm surprised you didn't bring up No Man's Sky. But that's one we both <laughs> agree. We both hate that That's one. not a UI. That's a torment system. <laughs> uh, the original Fallout is pretty terrible. The interface, especially the press this mysterious big red button to switch to your other hand. Like, how would you even understand what that button does? What? Yeah, you have two hands. Well, sometimes if you have a shotgun, then it takes up both slots and the red button doesn't do anything. But then sometimes you can have, a, you know, you can have like a pistol in one hand and a med pack in the other hand. So... You know, if you get injured, you can just swap to your other hand for free and use the, the stim pack and then switch back to your pistol. And that's like a free action. But it, I see what they were trying to do, but like it was weird and counterintuitive and ugly as hell. And they had wonderful text in the game that there wasn't nearly enough of there should have been way more because what little was there was really good and it would have benefited from more descriptions but you wouldn't notice any of it because it's all like there's just this teeny tiny little postage stamp window in the corner where it just scrolls by and you can't like you have to like scroll bar up like it can show a sentence and a half so you you know, the big narration of like, oh, you are seeing natural, you leave the vault and it has this little narration about how you are seeing sunlight for the first time in your natural life. And you would totally miss it because it's just scrolling by in the window that report, that normally just reports, yeah, you shoot the rat for five damage. The rat bites ah. you for two damage. It doesn't even look like anything's going on there. And you'd miss it. Um... Also flawed, I would say Mass Effect, the original's inventory system is infamously bad. And Kerbal Space Program, I've always been frustrated that there's a lot of really important stuff that gets left out. And everybody has to download mods to get the to, oh, yeah. to get the information. Yeah, they fixed some of it, but it's still not perfect. Right. And it's not like this stuff is secret. If you have a space program, then you have this information available to you it's not supposed to be hidden or secret it's just the ui doesn't show it some things it's like if i leave my spacecraft and look at my spacecraft through the the radar system at mission control i can know these facts about my trajectory but i can't know it when i'm piloting it it's just weird yeah yeah it's, it's kind of odd so I think the biggest offender for me, a game that like I wanted to get into, but I just could not get past the user interface, was was System Shock One. No, I totally agree. The original System Shock is weird as hell by today's standards. Yeah, Those yeah, and they didn't know any better. Like now right. we know, oh, WASD and mouse look is the way to go, and it's the standard. And even if there's something better, like everyone knows it already. But like they had, they were forging new territory, and they they really had to try something, and it, what they tried wasn't perfect. I can even see the appeal of aiming with the mouse, aiming with the mouse, where you can just like aim at any point on the screen and zap something at that point. That's actually kind of cool. But then you're turning with West, and that was terrible. Mm. <laughs> it feels like you're driving a forklift. Like, you turned so slowly, <laughs> and it was like, oh, I'm getting bit in the butt. Let me slowly pivot in place. Oh, it was bad. <laughs> uh. um, yeah, and the inventory screens at the bottom where they could be just these multi-use screens and show different information was, again, I see what they were going for, but yeah, that's, that's not good. Mm, yeah, inscrutable to a modern audience. Yeah. Yeah, so we've got one more email here, but I like what we've been doing every week. We end one email short of clearing out the mailbag. I think we should keep up that tradition. We'll leave this one. We'll leave this one for next week. 
Okay, thank you to everybody who sent in those questions. These are really good questions this week. If you've got a question for the show, our email is diecast at shamusyoung.com. Thanks for listening, everybody. Say goodbye, Paul. Bye.